Father, we're very grateful for this time, which we surrender to you, which we commit to you. I pray you bless it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm going to be speaking about eschatology, as the waters cover the sea is my topic. And I'm going to begin by talking, oh, oh I want to briefly define eschatology, the word eschatology, and then talk about how it matters to missions, and then get into what the Bible teaches. So uh, uh, the word eschatology is the study of the last things. It comes from the Greek word for the last, and there are two different kinds of eschatology. Uh, there are, there's the field of eschatology that talks about the ultimate final things, heaven, hell, judgment, um, that sort of, that's ultimate eschatology, which all conservative um, believing, uh, all conservative uh, believing Christians share. And then there would be eschatology, the study of the last things having to do with the last days of human history prior to the second coming of Christ. All right, so prior to the second coming of Christ, and you've got all kinds of uh, positions. Uh, Christians are all over the map when it comes to uh, differing eschatologies. What's going to happen? Is the world going to just go on the way it always has? Is the world going to continue to fall apart? Is it going to get worse and worse and worse? Then the Antichrist will come kicking, baby, kicking babies and puppies and, uh, you know, is he going to do awful things? Or is it going to get better and better uh, as, the, uh, as the gospel is proclaimed and the nations are discipled and so on? Now, when it comes to the first kind of eschatology, all Christians, all Orthodox Christians are optimistic um, because everyone who believes in heaven, anyone who believes in the final judgment is optimistic. Everything at the end of time, everything will be put right. Nothing will be out of place. Everything will be perfect. So all Christians are optimistic in that sense. All believing Christians are optimistic in that sense. But when it comes to uh, the word optimism and pessimism with regard to the progress of human history, the progress of the gospel in the world prior to the second coming of Christ, um, most evangelical Christians today in North America are pessimistic. They believe that things are falling apart and they're going to fall apart more rapidly as time goes on. Uh, they, they shake their heads watching the evening news. It's the last days, they say. Now, here's the irony. Um, uh, every uh, position, every worldview has an eschatology uh, by default. You either believe it's going your way, or you believe it's not going your way, or you believe it's not going any way. It's just indifferent to you. So the Marxists have an eschatology. The Marxists have an eschatology, and they believe that the uh, revolution, of the, the revolt of the proletariat, and the, the final uh, conquest of communism is inevitable. They believe history is on their side. And that's why uh, the, the phrase, don't get on the wrong side of history, is, uh, I think, a, a phrase or a thought that comes out of a Marxist bent. Marxists have an eschatology. Um, uh, Muslims have an eschatology, not a defined, not a defined eschatology, but they have a, uh, they are a very uh, this worldly faith. All right, so, um, as as we heard uh, last night, they uh, when Islam exploded out of Arabia, the first, um, well, uh, be almost a thousand years of uh, Islamic ascendancy was right in line with what they thought the pleasure of Allah was. Uh, uh, the, they thought the pleasure of Allah was being showered upon them, bestowed up, upon them, because they had an eschatology of victory. All right? They had an eschatology of victory. It's hard for us to imagine, but the Ottoman Empire was the center of civilization, and it, basically it was Kellerman. All right? So uh, Kellerman, this huge empire to the south, and then Narnia and Archelander up to the north, these little um, free countries up there. Uh, but they weren't, they weren't all that strong. And so you had that for century after century after century, and that fed into an, eschat an eschatological expectation. We are winning. We are, this is a victorious faith. Our faith is a victorious 
faith. Now, something odd happened, and I'm going to use this. I want you to use this as the backdrop of what I'm going to say when, when I get into the, the text. The, uh, there were three battles that uh, happened uh, coming into the modern era that should have told them uh, an attentive Muslim advisor to Suleiman the Magnificent that th uh, th he should have said something like, uh-oh, you know. Uh, uh, uh. The battles were the Battle of Malta, the Battle of Lepanto, which was a sea battle, and the Battle of Vienna. All right, so in the 17th century, 1600s, the Battle of Vienna, and then the century before, the Battles of Malta, where Suleiman the Magnificent failed to take the island of Malta that was uh, held by a very small contingent of Christians. It was an epic battle and needs to have a movie made of it. And Lepanto was a battle where Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, was wounded at, that, at the Battle of Lepanto. If you want to read one of the best poems in the English language, um, Chesterton's uh, Lepanto is uh, uh, just a great, great poem. Now, those three battles marked the sort of like the high watermark of Islamic ascendancy. Of course, they, they quit expanding earlier with the, the Battle of Tours that, were, that was mentioned earlier. But these battles were more significant because it was right before the tide began to um, ebb. And then, uh, I'm, I'm compressing centuries here, but after the First World War, the Western powers, the Christian powers, we, living in the West as we do, and having the view of the Bible that we do, we don't think of our civilization as Christian, not very Christian at all. Um, but people from outside uh, see the Christianity everywhere. It's uh, uh, one of the things that was striking to me, uh, interacting with uh, an atheist like Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens and Dawkins and people like that, they come, when they come to America, they feel like they're coming into a hotbed of Puritanism. And if you look at it through their cosmopolitan eyes, one sees their point. But Muslims think of the Western powers as Christian powers. And after the First World War, the Christian powers walked into the Middle East and carved it up like it was a pie and just handed out pieces to different people. You do this, and you do that, and you do the other thing. And, I must add, carved up the pie pretty stupidly. You know, it was, there was a lot of blunders there, but the fact was that they had the firepower to carve it up like a pie. Now, there's, it gets even weirder. Um, the Muslims, with an eschatology of victory, started realizing with uh, dismay and like epistemic confusion, practical, tangible, this worldly defeat, right? Defeat after defeat after defeat, and so consequently, what we are, what we tend to uh, look at as sort of a, a a triumph of sheer iron will, you know, terrorist bomber blowing himself up uh, to take out an Israeli delicatessen or something like that. We look at that as look how committed they are. No, I would say, look at how panicked they are. These are the kamikaze planes at the end of the war. This is, they don't know what to do. They've lost Allah's favor. How do we get it back? The Muslim Brotherhood was born after the, uh, uh, in the early part of the 20th century in reaction to this, uh, this astonishing turn of events. A good book, if you want to, uh, not by a believer, but a, uh, a Middle East scholar, Bernard Lewis, wrote a book called What Went Wrong? And he's, he is talking about the Muslim worldview uh, just disintegrating. So they've got an optimistic eschatology, and it's all falling apart in their hands. Christians, evangelical Christians, have a pessimistic eschatology. The Antichrist is going to take over any minute now, and we are kicking butt all over the world. And you say, what? Africa is becoming Christian at an astonishing rate. Um, even if, I'm, if I were a Marxist or if I were any other worldview, uh, and someone said, what, what worldview is the most worrisome to you? It'd be evangelical Christianity. And I would, I'm casting the net broadly. I would include Charismatics, Pentecostals, every, you know, conservative, Protestant, Bible-believing uh, Christians. 
And many of them have a very pessimistic eschatology, and yet it's uh, being astonishingly effective all over the place. And one wonders, maybe God doesn't want us to have an optimistic eschatology because we'd run, because we'd run amok. I, I, I think, what would we do if we actually believed the promises of God? So um, I believe that in the long run, there, the, a dissonance between what we're doing and, and what we think we believe has to be resolved. Um, men are not good at long-range, long, long-term inconsistency. So we have to anchor ourselves to the scriptures. What, is, what does the Bible teach? And we have to ground our hope uh, for missions and for evangelism and for evangelism of subcultures, um, like the Muslim subculture in the West, evangelism of subcultures like that. We have to ground our hope on the promises of scripture, not on our wisdom or our uh, mastery of the techniques and so on. So with that, let's turn to some of the scriptures. One of the great difficulties that modern Christians have is that we do not let the two testaments inform one another. Because of this neglect on our part, we miss many visions of the coming glory that the Old Testament prophets set before us. And as a people starved for glory, we ought not to miss any of it whenever God offers it. We, uh, if God offers glory, if God promises glory, we ought to seize on it. We ought not to be shutting out any of God's promises for our planet. Now, I need to say one other thing. Uh, I believe that future school children, a thousand years from now, will be studying hard, trying to, uh, and they'll be quizzing one another. I can never remember who lived first. Was it Augustine or C.S. Lewis? Um, those early church fathers always get muddled up in my mind. Um, I believe that we're part of the early church, in other words. Um, this is, we're still sorting a bunch of things out. I believe there's a long way to go. There's a big world to evangelize. And we are going to do it on the basis of God's promises. So in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, <coughs> I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, this is Jesus, the one like the Son of Man, coming for, before the Ancient of Days, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So, in the night visions, Daniel sees someone like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is quoted a number of times in the New Testament, and we frequently assume that he's coming on the clouds of heaven to earth. We think it's the second coming. It's not the second coming. It's the ascension. Christ is coming. The one like a, the one like a son of man is coming into the courts of heaven. He's coming before the ancient of days on the clouds of heaven where he is given universal dominion. So this one, like the son of man, approaches the ancient of days, who is God the Father, and is brought before him, verse 13. When this mysterious figure approaches the Ancient of Days, the end result is that universal dominion is then bestowed on him. Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. The nature of this kingdom was that all people, nations, and languages would serve him. Verse 14. His dominion was to be everlasting, and the kingdom he was receiving would never be destroyed. Verse 14 again. And therefore, preaching the kingdom of God, among other things, means preaching this. You cannot preach Christ's work and his, uh, his work and his person without preaching what his work is now. He is, the, he is Lord. That's, this is the fundamental Christian confession. Jesus is Lord. Remember how John the forerunner appeared out of the wilderness preaching the kingdom. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christians preach, Christians are to preach the kingdom. That's Matthew 3, 1 and 2. 
Recall that Jesus came also preaching the kingdom. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. That's Matthew 4.23. And realize that the early Christians did the same thing. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's Acts 8.12. And behold, then come some of our modern Christians preaching self-care and your best life now. They preach the kingdom. We preach uh, what's called a therapeutic moral deism. Um, and that's not, the gospel, that's not the biblical message. The biblical message is Christ is Lord. And the Lord, that, who has universal dominion, is the one who died for you to make it possible for your sins to be forgiven. So, the first thing to note is how Jesus identifies with this phrase, the Son of Man. Although the phrase is common in the Old Testament, this passage in Daniel is the only place in the entire Old Testament where it is used in a messianic sense. Thus, it is a, it's a messianic term here, but not a common messianic term. So it's a messianic term, but it isn't used that way most of the time. The Lord Jesus uses it of himself, and this simultaneously conceals and reveals his identity. He's using an off-the-beaten-path term from the Old Testament, which is clear enough. It's clearly a messianic term in the one place where it's used, but it's not, it's not overtly messianic. Some common examples would be Mark 2.10, Mark 8.38, Mark 10.33. The Lord Jesus did not want his disciples proclaiming his identity until the time was right. He didn't want a premature proclamation of who he was. After his resurrection and ascension, Romans 1.4, the time was more than right, and so 2,000 years into it, this reality has to be declared to the rest of the world. So in Romans 1.4, it says Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. You notice that during his earthly ministry, when uh, the demons say who Jesus is, uh, he tells them to be quiet. Uh, you know, don't, don't talk to anybody. When Peter makes his famous confession, he says, keep it under your hats. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, but after he's raised from the dead, the message is now. Now tell everybody. And you can tell everybody because Jesus has ascended into the, uh, before the Ancient of Days, and has been given universal dominion. So everywhere, uh, everywhere that you go and, and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, wherever it is you are, Jesus already is the Lord of that place. He already owns that place where you're preaching. And so um, think of it this way. Um, I remember this was some a few decades ago, but it was decades after the close of the Second World War, it was in the 70s, maybe even the 80s, um, the last Japanese soldier surrendered in the Philippines. He'd been living up in the jungle, um, conducting guerrilla raids and, uh, you know, just carrying the war on for years and years and years and years. And he finally was, uh, finally was brought in. So the war was over, the war was completely over, the war was totally over, but somebody hadn't gotten the word, right? Well, that's what our evangelism is like. The devil's capital city has fallen. The devil's capital city has fallen. He's triumphed over the principalities and powers. He destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. God is victorious over the devil in Christ. He bound the strong man, took all his armor, took all his stuff. That happened and we're 2000 years into it. What is evangelism then? Evangelism is trying to persuade that Japanese soldier to come down out of the jungle. <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing. And there are villages and hamlets and, and okay, an empire or two that <laughs> they don't want to admit what, what's happened, but we're declaring what has in fact happened. And this is, uh, I, I want to leave this with you because I think if you get a hold of this, it really represents a... Um, like a, 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 a Copernican revolution in your head where it shifts, you shift from thinking of the cosmos one way and you start thinking of it a, a, another way. 
So most of you are Americans, so I will admonish you as Americans. As good Americans, you are used to the presidential cycle of wanting to select a leader every four years. And most of our evangelism is trying to get Jesus elected president. And we're trying to recruit people to join the campaign team because we need more people to hand out leaflets. And if we get a movement going, at some point we can get enough people on board and we get all these people on board, they'll all vote for Jesus and then Jesus can be our Lord. But that's not how it works. This is a monarchy. What, what are we preaching? We're preaching a kingdom. And the kingdom has a king. And the king is already on his throne. The, king, the coronation ceremony has already occurred 2,000 years ago. The coronation ceremony has already occurred. Our task is to herald or announce or proclaim what has already happened and is going to continue to have already happened whether you like it or not. Now, that's an eschatology of victory. And I believe uh, it, nothing can stand before it. If, if this truth gets into our bones and we understand that Jesus, no, I mean, Jesus is Lord, uh, we're going to preach this till the end of the world. So this is what we are charged to declare. The universal lordship over and consequent salvation of the entire world. The king is in his heaven. He rules over earth and heaven. And today, every, every Lord's Day, is the day that we mark to celebrate his coronation. And we do it in partic uh, particularly on Ascension Sunday, because that's what this passage from Daniel 7 is describing. So, what is, the, what is the phrase, the clouds of heaven? What does that phrase mean? We have to let the Bible define what a phrase means. When we think of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, what do we tend to think? We almost always think of the second coming with Jesus descending to earth on the clouds of heaven. But that's not what it means at all. The fact that Jesus ascended into heaven on the clouds all right, is not meant with regard to prophecy to point to another event many thousands of years later. Although Jesus will come the same way he left as the angel promised, his manner of going was the beginning of the fulfillment itself. So when it wasn't, it wasn't like Jesus was saying, I'm going to go away for thousands of years, and when I return, the prophecy from Daniel is going to be fulfilled. Jesus ascended into heaven, and that moment was the beginning of the, was the, beginning of the fulfillment of the Son of Man, the one like a Son of Man coming into the presence of the Ancient of Days. So his manner of going was the beginning of the fulfillment itself. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, for which we may excuse them, <laughs> it's okay, right? as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's Acts 1, 9 through 11. So Jesus is going to come back the way you saw him go. Where is this quoted, this clouds of heaven business? Where is it quoted? The first place to consider is in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Because we're not as uh, familiar with some of the terminology of the first century uh, believers, we, it's easy for us to make the mistake of thinking that he, so, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, being the gathering in of the elect at the end of history. But I believe it's the Great Commission. He shall, uh, the, the, Bible, the word angel simply means messenger. So uh, celestial beings are frequently messengers. They, have, they come with a message from 
uh, heaven, but John the Baptist, for example, is called a messenger, an angel. John the Baptist has a message from God, and so he's an angel. Um, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, their pastors are called angels, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, right, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. And so um, angels are simply messengers. So he shall send his messengers, God will send his messengers, and they are going to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. This is the great commission. This is the great gathering of all God's saints. And it's the consequence of what? It's the consequence of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven into the presence of the Ancient of Days. So what happens when, when the one like the Son of Man comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days? What happens there? Well, as we read in the text, God, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, gives him all the nations of earth. That's what happens. That's the transaction. Jesus ascends from the Mount of Olives. He ascends into the heavens. He goes into the throne room of the Ancient of Days. He's crowned. He's seated at the, the right hand of God the Father. And God says in Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Sit there. Stay, stay seated there until all your enemies are a footstool. So how long will Jesus sit? How long will Jesus be enthroned at the right hand of the Father? Until all his enemies are a footstool. For he must reign, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So what's going to happen? Here's the breakout. Uh, in the popular pessimistic eschatology, when Jesus returns, the first enemy to be destroyed is death. All the enemies have their heyday. This is their day. This is their hour. They just keep doing bad things. And finally, Jesus is going to intervene. He's going to come. And when he comes, the dead are raised. The very first thing that happens is the dead are raised and death is destroyed. But the Bible doesn't say that the first enemy to be destroyed is death. It says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That means Jesus is going to destroy the last enemy, death, by his personal appearing in power and glory. And prior to that time, all the other enemies are going to be subdued by his body, the church, through the preaching of the gospel, through planting churches, through one-on-one -on -one evangelism, through group evangelism, through all the things we're talking about doing here. The angels go out and gather in the elect. So the Son of Man goes into the presence of the Ancient of Days. He is given all the nations, he's every, all the tribes, all the language, all, every language, everybody. Uh, and just to spell it out, he's given Canada, he's given the United States, he's given Mexico, and all, all the way around, he's given the entire Middle East. Everything, every nation is given to him. Why does Turkey belong to Jesus? He bought it with his blood. Why does Iran belong to Jesus? He bought it with his blood. Why does China belong to Jesus? He bought it with his blood. All right, so why would Jesus buy the nations of men with his blood and then refuse to take them home? That makes no sense. So Jesus is given universal dominion, and then he sends his angels out to gather in the elect. So this is not a sign in heaven, but rather a sign concerning the Son of Man who is in heaven. The tribes of the earth see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, in Daniel, he, where does he come? Into the presence of the Ancient of Days. His authority is apparent on earth. The tribes do see it. The tribes do see it, but the coming is most apparent in heaven. The coming is manifested in heaven, but the effect of the coming is seen on earth. Put simply, he's crowned in heaven, we see the ramifications of that coronation on earth. The Jews who put Jesus on trial understood the ramifications of this phrase better than many modern Christians do. This is why tearing his robes, the high priest, <coughs> the high priest considered the statement blasphemous. Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his, rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold now, you have heard his, you have heard his blasphemy. 
Matthew 26, 64, and 65. We should pay close attention to this because this is the passage that brought about the conviction of Jesus. This was the passage that condemned him. These were the words that condemned him because Jesus said, that applies to me. The high priest tore his robes and said, you've heard the blasphemy. Now, what does this mean? Returning to Daniel, what did the Lord Jesus receive after he departed from the disciples' sight in a cloud? What did he receive when he approached the Ancient of Days? The scriptures are exceedingly clear on the point. He received everlasting dominion, glory, and an indestructible and universal kingdom. This is the kingdom we are supposed to preach. The early Christians preached the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom. John the Baptist preached the kingdom. We need to preach the kingdom. And we, so we preach the kingdom, and we teach people to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. We, we shouldn't be praying for the kingdom to go. We're praying for the kingdom to come. And the kingdom to come is the kingdom where the, the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is manifested. So Jesus is in, um, in principle and in truth, enthroned at the right hand of God the Father, and he is currently today the king of these United States. He is the king of Canada. He is the king of Mexico and so on. He is the king. Now, we live in uppity times. We don't want him to be the king. We don't want this man to rule over us. And so we say he's not the king. We deny that he's the king. We say that we have a First Amendment. The, the First Amendment, first, the First Amendment doesn't say what you think it says. And second, even if it did, it doesn't trump Daniel 7. So if the First Amendment really did say that we are going to have no opinion whatever on the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then those who advocate the Lordship of Jesus Christ should say, that's too bad because Jesus is Lord. But the First Amendment does, all the First Amendment says is that there will be no church of the United States. We were at the founding, we were a confederation of sovereign states and we didn't want a national established church like there's a church of Denmark, like there's a church of England. We didn't want a national church because, and this should be, think about it for a minute. If you have a national bird, like the bald eagle, and you have a state bird, like the Oriole is for Maryland. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, so I know that. I was taught it. They made sure to teach it to me. Um, so I think the Idaho bird is a bluebird, mountain, mountain bluebird. So you have a, a state bird and you have a national bird. Are any wars likely to come out of that? Extremely, even given the sinfulness of man, <laughs> that's, an, that's highly unlikely. If you have a national anthem and you have a state anthem or a national poet laureate and a state level poet laureate, no conflicts are likely to arise out of that. But if you have a national established church and then provincial or state level established churches, what's likely to happen? Immediate conflict, immediate conflict. And when the Constitution of the United States was adopted in 1789, there were 13 colonies, and nine of the 13 colonies had established state churches. They tax money was paid to the, the state government, and they supported um, the, the whatever. In Connecticut, it was the Congregational Church, and Connecticut was the last state to get rid of an established state church, and they didn't do that until the 18. 30s. Now, I, I'm not saying this because I'm arguing for state-level established churches. I don't think established churches are a good idea. I think it's a kiss of death for that whatever denomination that might be. I don't think it's a good idea. But separation, because, and I also believe that separation of church and state is a biblical ideal. But that's not the same thing as the separation of God and state or the separation of Christ and state or the separation of morality and state. Right? Those are different things. I don't want a particular denomination to be funded by taxes. That's, what, that's all I'm saying. But even though I think it's a bad idea 
to establish a, a particular Christian denomination at the state level, even though it's a bad idea, it's not an unconstitutional idea. It's not an unconstitutional idea because nine of the 13 colonies that adopted the Constitution had established state churches at the moment they were adopting it. So it's now, if someone says yes, but uh, secular, secularism is our current idol, and secularism is the pretense, secularism is the pretense that neutrality in civic affairs is somehow a possibility. Um, and you know how it goes. Let's say someone is nominated for a high office and he's announced his campaign. What are the report? And he's, he's known uh, as someone who attends a uh, strong Bible-believing denomination. He, he's a conservative believer. And what question is he going to be asked at the first press conference? He's going to be asked, can you make a distinction between your faith and the way you're going to discharge your uh, office if you are elected? And you know, you all know the catechism, the appropriate catechism answer, don't you? The appropriate catechism answer is for him to say, and if I'm a secular advisor to this guy, I would teach him, I would instruct him to say, my faith, which is very precious uh, to me, is a personal matter. And I vow that I will in no way allow my faith to dictate anything whatever with regard to my behavior if elected and, serve, and honored to serve as your representative in Washington, D.C. And everybody says, okay, I, all right, you, you, uh, you, you genuflected where you ought to have genuflected. We will, we will let it go for now. Now, let's say he gets elected, and six months later, he is pulled over by the cops in Washington, D.C. in a red convertible and a couple of prostitutes and $100,000 in cash in the trunk of the car, along with a couple of bundles of cocaine. Now, I would pay ready money to see the press conference where the senator, Senator Snotworth, let us call him, um, said, you remember that six months ago I solemnly promised the American people, that if elected, my faith, which is very precious to me, would not interfere with my behavior while in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the slightest, and I'm here to say, I have kept my promise. <laughs> and somebody's going to say, wait, uh, uh, you know what we mean. We didn't, we didn't mean for you to be running around with uh, painted ladies, and you know, we, we want you to be honest and upright and moral, but without Jesus. But you have to understand, people aren't built to be schizophrenic that way. Right? That's just schizoid. That's not how people function. They're going, to, they're going to live in line with their functional God. And if Christ is Lord, he's going to be Lord of their life in their official capacity and then their private capacity. Now, I, don't, I, be, I do believe in separation of church and state, but I don't believe in the separation of morality and state, and I don't believe in the separation of the ground of morality and state. What's the ground of morality? Christ is Lord. That's the ground of morality. Christ is the very image of the invisible God. So he is the king, and how, the, how his kingship is going to be mediated in a republic like ours and how it would be mediated in a constitutional monarchy and how it would be mediated in different, different nations with different um, political forms is an interesting question, but I think it's a question that Christian political theorists have to face. How, how do we uh, engage, how do we um, plug in the authority of Jesus Christ into this system? Now, if you have an autocratic dictator, uh, dictator uh, autocratic dictatorship, then the authority of Christ doesn't plug into that. That guy's got to go because he thinks he's God. But, and, and this is another way of saying, if Christ is Lord, then limited government is necessary. If Christ is Lord, then Caesar is not. If Christ is Lord, then Caesar is not Lord. So we preach the kingdom of God. And this is why uh, dictators, this is why uh, people who want absolute power are so hostile to the Christian faith because they understand the ramifications of the lordship of Christ better than many Christians do. So, Jesus received the heathen for his inheritance. 
and he received the uttermost ends of the earth for his possession, as it says in Psalm 2.8. He received the worship of all the families on earth and the remembrance of all the ends of the world, Psalm 22, 27. He will receive all men as they stream to him, the ensign of Jesse, that's Isaiah 11, 10, and his rest shall be glorious. The The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus as the Pacific Ocean is wet. Isaiah 11, 9. The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the Pacific Ocean is wet. The world will be evangelized. Prior to the second coming of Christ, the world will be Christian. China will be Christian. Thailand will be Christian. Russia will be Christian. Iran will be Christian. Brazil will be Christian. Every, and you're not going to be able to... Now, this doesn't mean that every last individual person is going to be regenerate. I have no, I, I have no doubt that some people are going to hold out and you know they're going to uh, keep their head down and just try to eva- uh, avoid and evade. But overwhelmingly, the nations are going to come to the one who owns them. The nations are going to come to the one who summons them. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up in the Gospel of John, he says, when he's lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. All men. The cross has a fascinating power. The cross, whenever it's preached, fascinates. It transfixes men, and they come. So, Christ is going to receive all of his adversaries, fashioned by the power of God into a footstool for him. Psalm 110, verse 1. He will receive the human race unveiled, Isaiah 25, 7, and he will set a feast of fat things full of marrow, full of fat, and wine on the lees, and well refined, Isaiah 25, 8. So the world, the one that we live in now, will be put to rights before the second coming, before the end of all things, before the second coming, before the end of all things. Now, that means all the enemies of man, all the enemies of Christ, the enemies of man, the enemies of good, that which is good, all of them, death only accepted, death being the only exception, are going to be subdued and conquered and brought to heel, all of them. Now, and Isaiah says even death is going to be somewhat tamed because Isaiah says the man who dies when he's 100 years old, will be considered cursed. Man, what did he do wrong? All right, we're, going to, we're going to be your great, 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 great grandchildren, and most of the people here, our ancestors, to many hundreds of thousands of great, great, great grandchildren, are going to sit under their fig tree, every man in peace. They're going to enjoy a blessed, glorious future. And they're going to... Uh, all the enemy, the things that plague us now, the things that afflict us now, whether they're cancers or you know uh, uh, tyrannies or, or natural disasters, tsunamis or earthquakes or hurricanes, uh, we're going to conquer through the gospel under Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, I can, I can do it. <laughs> In, in, the Old, in the Old Testament, the hierarchy is God is always, God is always sovereign. God is always and everywhere sovereign. Um, the hairs of our head are all numbered, what, regardless of what testament you're in. But in the Old Testament, God is sovereign, and then man is in his uh, minority. Man has not yet grown up to his majority, and man is under the tutelage of mediatorial princes, plural. Mediatorial princes, many of them fallen. And these princes, many of them, received worship as though they themselves were gods and goddesses. And so you have God, mediatorial princes, and then man. And when nations went to war with one another, their gods were going to war with one another. Um, And we have, so when Daniel prays, and three weeks later, an angel shows up kind of disheveled and, and says, I've 
I would have been hurt earlier, but I got in a fight with the Prince of Persia on the way. Uh, you have combat going on in the realm of the principalities and power, and then man. In the New Covenant, there's been a cosmological revolution. Cosmological revolution. It's still God overall, but now there's one prince, Messiah the prince. One prince and only one prince. God the Father, God, God is over all, Messiah the prince, and then man in Christ, and then angels. All right, so um, angels have been, it, it, angels were like the, um, the caregivers, uh, like a minimum wage um, caregiver feeding a billionaire sitting in a high chair his mashed peas. So this billionaire in the high chair owns billions, but still has to go to bed when, the, when the, his nanny says go to bed. She's in charge of him, but he's going to grow to a certain age. He's going to enter into his inheritance. And when that happens, she takes the lower place. That's what's happened in Christ. You have God, now you have Messiah the Prince, then you have man in Christ, and then you have angels. Angels were sent to serve those who were to inherit salvation, as it says. For God did not subject the world to come, of which we speak, to angels. That's what it says in Hebrews. So this, the world to come, the world that we're entering into, the world that we're still on the threshold of, that world belongs to you in Christ. That world belongs to uh, Jesus bought it all, and you are the body of Christ. Now, you might say, are you, you know, this sounds like kind of future, you know, science fiction, gee wizardry, and are you, are you saying that we're going to tame tornadoes? Yes. Yes. I don't know how, but we, we don't see, it even says that in Hebrews. We don't, see, uh, we, we don't see him exercising dominion yet. We see God has put, Psalm 8, God has put all things in subjection to man, but we don't see everything subject to him yet, the author of Hebrews says, but we see Jesus, all right? And there's got to be a way to tame the tornadoes, uh, this, which reminds me of a joke. Um, what's the difference between, uh, uh, um, what, what, do a, what does a redneck divorce and a tornado have in common? In both cases, somebody loses a mobile home. <laughs> Do tornadoes know what they're doing? Yes, they always attack mobile home parks. <laughs> they're just going over Kansas, looking for a touchdown. Why is it always, no, it's never, I, I digress. Do I believe, but do I believe that man in Christ has a glorious future? Yeah. And our task of evangelism is recruiting people from all over the world to come join the choir, to jump to come join the, the workforce, to, to come join the, the army. So the only enemy not destroyed through the advance of the gospel will be death itself, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And even that enemy will be in a confused retreat, Isaiah 65, 20, where the man who dies when he's 100. Uh, so notice in this era, people still die. Death is still a possibility. People still die, but it's really beaten back. The ramifications of this are many, but one of the things it means is that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So return to your labors encouraged. You know your weaknesses, that's true enough, but now hear the words of your God. Ours, we have weaknesses, we have many weaknesses, but ours are invincible weaknesses. Because one like a son of man has entered into the throne room of the heavens. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the laughter of the saints needs to be deep and full and rich and absolutely filled with faith. One throne stands absolutely secure. One throne is untouchable by any political upheavals here. One throne cannot be reached with a stupid referendum. One throne cannot be touched, and that's the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are his servants. You are his body. You are the extension of Christ's presence in the world. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for all the things you've given to us. We thank you in the name of Jesus.
and amen.